In the early days of the war in Ukraine, photographer Sawan Georges made a photograph of a woman on a train. She was looking out through a steamy window, tears streaming down her cheeks, her hand pressed against the glass to connect with her husband. When describing that image to me, Washington Post Director of Photography Marianne Golan said, I feel his photographs before I see them. There is a purity to Salwan, a purity to his heart and his vision, the way in which he relates to people. He is a unicorn. Salwan, perhaps more than most, could relate to the emotions that he captured on that train platform. He told me, home is not a place. Home is where your loved ones are. You make home. Born during the Iraq-Kuwait War and growing up during the US imposed sanctions on Iraq, challenging times were the norm. He has described one of his favorite childhood memories of watching fireworks from his apartment building as the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. Years later, he learned that he was watching missiles being fired at US military jets, not fireworks. When Salwan and his mother left Iraq for Syria and wrote to the US, he learned Aramaic from local monks. I mention this because Aramaic is referred to as the first world language, the language of connectivity. Today, it might be tempting to think of photography as our shared language. If so, Salwan is absolutely fluent across multiple disciplines. And although he speaks several languages, he feels that language isn't necessary to do his job. Treating people with respect, with dignity, is the key. He believes that his mission is to raise awareness that photojournalism is important because storytelling can affect change. Given that Salwan has been named Photographer of the Year by both Pictures of the Year International, the National Press Photographers Association, and has been both a finalist and a winner of the Pulitzer Prize, I would say that his stories do have impact. Whether he is reporting on the fentanyl crisis, racial reckoning, or climate change, he gets to the heart of every story. Or, as his friend and mentor Ed Cashy says, Salwan is a sensitive soul, gentle in nature, but fierce when he must be. His images are powerful, intimate, and visually dynamic. He understands what it means to lose everything. And while he may seem like he now has it all, he never forgets his past, where he comes from, and the importance and respect he must have for people from all walks of life. Please welcome Salwan to the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for staying with us here. Um, I wanted to thank uh, CNL Awards for having me and inviting me to be among one of the best in, uh, in the business and uh, in the world. And um, I want to thank also um, the Washington Post for allowing me to do the work I do now. Uh, without them, I would uh, be uh, looking and pitching stories. Uh, unfortunately, now I have barely any time to do stories. Um, but um, but I wanted to talk to you specifically today about the year I had, um, 2022. Um, not, um, um, I mean, a lot happened in the world, uh, but uh, for me, I had to cover two different kind of wars. And um, uh, you would, uh, not actual wars, one of them, but it's one war at home for me in the US. So I started the year uh, getting ready, packing to go to, um, Afghanistan, while I have a connection in Turkey, uh, I got a call from my editor and they were like, uh, can you reroute and go to Ukraine? Something may happen there, but we don't know. Can you um, change your plans? And I have packed different clothes, as many journalists know, like different equipment for different assignments, different clothing. Ukraine, it's uh, snowing. Uh, Afghanistan was totally different climate at that time. So um, 
I got to Ukraine on a really special day, February 14th. It was Valentine's Day. A lot of uh, people sharing love on the street. Um, it was uh, National Flag Day. Um, people uh, were doing what every people in other cities do, buying groceries, sitting at a coffee shop, um, enjoying life. Life was totally normal until uh, we started traveling to the Dumbas because uh, this was right before the war. In the Dumbas region, it was totally different. Uh, people are fleeing from different areas, the, the, uh, the rebel-held area between Ukraine and Russia. Um, the war there never stopped for years, since 2014, in the first invasion. And uh, the shelling was increasing, people were losing their home, um, people were fleeing, and cities like um, here in Severodonetsk were totally full of life. Now these cities are under the Russian occupation and um, partly destroyed. So I kind of got to see life in Ukraine in my first time. And, um, you know, before each assignment I do my research, I um, trying to learn as much as I can about a place. But um, when you have a day to uh, kind of change the whole assignment and change your whole idea, I, I try to read as much as I can. I've never been to Ukraine, it was my first time. And um, I was just doing what I, any, many photojournalists do, start walking the streets trying to learn about the place and the city. And um, I photographed this wedding in the morning, that was uh, February 23rd. And then the people were holding a rally. Uh, this was in Kharkiv. And then on the morning of uh, February 24th, I was uh, getting ready to board a train back to Kyiv. Uh, Kharkiv, it's uh, about 30 minutes from the Russian border. Couldn't be any close to Russia. And then uh, that morning I was facing my family, telling them I'm, I'm going back to Kyiv and probably flying back to, uh, to Afghanistan to continue my original assignment. As we're talking, all of a sudden, uh, Russian President finished, uh, Putin finished his speech and missiles started running running down all across the city. And um, things changed. Um, put my vest on, grabbed my stuff, and then we went down on the street with my team. Um, a, a lot of women and children were hiding in the train stations. Um, missiles were actively hidden. Uh, there was shelling here and there. There was a lot of confusion. People uh, packed those train stations that just a day before, um, as you saw, there was a, a wedding, a couple taking their wedding picture on the street, and now the, this chaos in the street. Um, the city is kind of lifeless compared to just the day before. A lot of families were trying to reach their loved ones. They, um, many of the men went to, to participate, went to uh, training, went to grab a gun and go help. Uh, that's one thing I haven't seen in other places. Uh, I felt that um, in Ukraine, I saw um, that every single person I met is ready to die for their country. As, as other places, and being in, born in, in, in Iraq, in a war-torn country, a lot of people prefer to leave, uh, search for a better life. But um, in Ukraine, people were been preparing, they know it's coming, but I think it caught them kind of by surprise how it happened. Um, we spent a couple of weeks uh, during the first few days of the war. Um, we were on the streets, going to bomb shelters with families, um, and then we were going to those uh, um, military volunteer um, headquarters where people were going showing their ID and Almost everybody I talked to, they were doctors, they were um, teachers, they were just like every one of us, let's say. Everybody wanted to defend their country. They would say goodbye, they would uh, exchange hugged, and then they got put on trucks and then sent to the front line or sent to quick training. And just so you know, this is the first week of the war, maybe second week, so it was totally different time than now. Um, we were one of the last uh, 
journalist to leave Kharkiv, um, me and another team from different publications, uh, our security advisors and other people uh, asked us to leave because the city was about to get encircled. But it never did, thankfully. Uh, but we had to make an escape. And I remember we were driving down the street um, and the Ukrainians are pointing their machine guns toward, you know, down the street and everybody's setting up through the trenches and we're driving that way. <laughs> and I was like, uh, well, I guess it's only a mile they make a left. But you never know what could be in that mile. It could be Russian anywhere, Russian forces. And as we were driving, making our way to Dnipro River, to, and then we picked to go to the south, to near the Black Sea, a city called Odessa. That is the third largest city in Ukraine. And the reason why we wanted to go there, because we have different teams. Uh, Kharkiv was about to get encircled. We didn't want to get stuck. It's always better to tell a story from you know, the outside. Um, and then slowly, um, if there's an opening, you go in, which is other colleagues went in afterwards in Kharkiv. We continue staying in the south. During this time, Marupul, as many of you know, maybe was happening. Bucha was happening. They were discovering those mass graves. There was fighting happening everywhere. And, you know, covering an event like this, you cannot be everywhere. You just have to go wherever um, your team is going and trust the editors and then uh, trying to make photo. I know I wasn't making you know, frontline photos. I know I wasn't making uh, uh, mass graves photos at that time, but I knew I had to make photos to contribute to the coverage of my newspaper to the war. And sometimes it doesn't have to be um, a body on the ground or something to make people aware of what's happening in, um, in this country and uh, the ugly side of the war, which is, I know personally, I've lived it. And um, our first stop, my colleagues got to, we got to our small hotel, one of the only hotel open in town. I just, I, I do this in a lot of places. Um, um, I, I wasn't advised to leave alone, but I kind of make my best photos when I'm left alone sometimes. So I ended up walking down the street. Uh, it was past the curfew hour. And then I knew that at that time, a lot of people from, uh, east of Ukraine and Kherson, Mariupol were escaping in large number going to train station. This train station is in Odessa and was taking people all the way to Lviv, which is on the west and with the border of um, Poland and then hopefully finding some uh, safe haven. And um, I got there, there were a few photographers as it got darker, um, many photographers left and I was kind of like frustrated because I, I can't see, it was dark. Um, they, the train station turned the light off um, in, in the whole place because they don't want them to be targeted by the Russian forces, which is they've done that, they've shelled other train stations. Uh, as I was walking back, the, um, among many of the people you saw in the previous photo who couldn't make it on a train, I mean, those are elderly um, uh, people, uh, uh, grandmas, children, women, mainly women and children, because men had to stay and fight. They were not allowed to, uh, to leave. This was the first week of March, um, just right 10 days after the war. And uh, as I'm leaving, I, I saw a man standing, um, saying goodbye to his wife. And, uh, and uh, the that was the only window I saw light from. Not sure how the light was on, but imagine, you know, it's a dark train station, you're hearing crying voices, and you can barely see, and you see this window. So I, I, I took, that's the first photo I took of this series. I, I stood there, I took the photo, and I said, I'm gonna get closer, make eye contact. If, if the person doesn't say, you know, please leave, no. Um, it's, a, you know, I feel like, as a photographer, you kind of learn this universal language is by making eye content, and you can kind of tell if you are welcomed or not welcomed there. So I walked there. Um, I saw. I, I made eye contact with uh, later. Get to know his name is Georgie. Um, he was saying goodbye to his wife Maya and his children, and they were kissing. They were. Um, he, he gave me the okay. That's why I, I continue photographing from distance. Thankfully for technology, my cameras are silent to not 
you know, disturb this moment. Um, and then as I was um, just stayed my distance and the train slowly started to move and as it was moving, they were kissing, they were saying goodbye, they were um, um, kind of, um, he, he, he started crying and then it's one of those photographs that I've made in my life where as I'm doing it, I don't, I don't remember taking the photos. It's like it, the camera becomes, um, I don't remember holding a camera. I remember just living through this. And it's one of those um, moments that when you take this similar image, you are affected, but you don't know how it's affecting you until later. And I'll tell you how in a minute. And I continue um, capturing this image until the train is sped up. And then Georgie started walking back. And um, thanks to technology, I don't speak Ukrainian. I grabbed my Google. I didn't have a fixer or translator or anybody. And I approach, uh, I waited for, I walked slowly th with Georgie until we got almost to the door and I talked to him for a minute through. I said, this is who I am. I captured these images, I showed him on my screen and I told him, uh, you can say no, I don't have to publish this. I just want to ask you if it's okay to get your name and publish it. If you say no, that's fine. Even though I felt like I captured something special, but for me, what they were going through is way, way, way more important. That's why I didn't, I didn't even approach him until he was done um, and, and walking outside. And he said, okay. And actually, just last Christmas, I touched bases with him, his wife and children there in uh, uh, Germany. And uh, he's uh, still living in, on the uh, outskirts of Odessa. He didn't get sent to the front line. And it was, I was really happy to hear he was okay. And... Um, the reason why later as I was walking in the dark to my hotel, uh, why this photo affected me because um, uh, I didn't edit right away. I got to my hotel. Thankfully for the advantage of the time difference, I was ahead of uh, the deadline of the newspaper. Um, and then um, all I could think of after this photo is how uh, my dad put my mom and I on a bus and sent us to um, Syria and um, all I remember looking from that window, seeing my dad crying on the sidewalk and wondering if I'm ever going to see him again. So at that time, I wasn't a photographer, uh, but I kind of got to see it from the outside for the first time, reliving my, how my family left Iraq. So, you know, as a photojournalist, you continue, um, want to share the story, you want to continue working on the story. I um, got the next day, I got my camera, I charged everything, make sure everything went to the newsroom and started uh, exploring more parts of Odessa. And uh, I, I went to this uh, place where they were training for how to use the weapon and I asked uh, uh, the, the person in the middle and uh, she was like, I'm a, I'm a dancer, but you know, I have to defend my country. And that was so amazing. And there, I met so many great people who just said, you know, we're not leaving, we're gonna stay. Uh, we, we knew this day was coming, basically. And, uh, and I started exploring other areas and how they were protecting their most precious um, um, uh, statues in the city of Odessa. And this, is, this is near the Opera House, iconic Opera House in Odessa. And Odessa sits on the Black Sea. So another reason why we went there because we were told the Russian ships about to make a landing on the beach, which is they never did. But as a photographer, you have to continue working. You have to keep every single day, go make fun and interesting images. And um, after a while, um, not much was happening and I have to make something. Um, so we decided to travel about two, two hours and a half to closer to the east where f actual fighting is happening. We got to uh, Mikulayev and that's another city on the uh, Black Sea close to Kherson. And what was happening there, it was act active shelling. We continued to meet other uh, people and tell their stories. And this, this um, uh, bomb, uh, parachute bomb fell on this hotel. We were just around the corner about to go on that, down that street and interview one of the officers who were helping people, recruit people to fight. And we just missed it by like maybe 10 minutes. And then uh, we wanted to also, near the airport in Mykolaiv, there's, uh, uh, let's say, projects where a lot of, in America we call them projects, which is apartment buildings 
uh, for maybe lower income people and um, sometimes refugees. If you, that country have a refugees problem, they put them there. So we met uh, Diana who was celebrating her fifth birthday in, in the basement uh, with her dad um, and, and mom. And uh, I, I, can, I can never forget her smile as, as active shelling above us. She's smiling, she's playing with her toy, hugging her uh, teddy bear, um, speaking to me in Ukrainian, I'm smiling. I mean, that's all I can, and then I found out what she's saying through a translator. Uh, but, you know, she's just being a kid. She's happy with her birthday, uh, celebrating her birthday regardless where she is. And her parents told me, I hope she never get to, she, she doesn't remember this ever. We hope so. And I kind of started thinking of my own family. I wonder if this is what my family did, you know, with me. They just, as things were happening and we just kept, uh, I don't remember much of it. I mean, now you do as you grow up. It, it never leaves you. But I really hope... Diana doesn't remember any of, especially her fifth birthday. We spent a lot of time, as I'm sure there are a couple of journalists here who were with me in Ukraine, uh, we spent a lot of times in the shelter because what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, um, for, like it wasn't a normal war. The, 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 it was, it was kind of shelling everywhere. There was no such a thing as a front line the first few days. You know, chaos cre um, you know, uh, creates opportunities. So we're able to move in an area to kind of tell stories of people closer to the front line. I went back to Odessa. I started <laughs> going alone, walking without my team to look for stuff. I got to the children hospital where these newborns who just came from the east seeing really horrific things and um, making it to, um, to Odessa and still constantly every time the siren goes on, they have to bring their kids up and down, hide in the shelter. And, and just, just imagine you just escape seeing your city being destroyed, um, barely getting killed in Mariupol. As you know, it was very bad to come here and you constantly, you know, in fear of, of, of Russia, the Russian forces basically bombing uh, a hospital, which is they have, as you know, the famous story in Mariupol. We started kind of like getting access slowly. This is a city that was just liberated. It's called Bashtinka. It's north of Mykolaiv. Um, this is kind of access finally is happening in the south. As you guys know, remember, this is the first few days, it was the first few weeks, days. It was not like now or it's o over a year now. Um, we were in, in spend, spending time seeing where the people, a lot, of, um, a lot of the people we talked to, they were like, you're the first uh, journalist we see. The last people were just, you know, uh, Russian soldiers. Um, you see the trash of the armed military, Russian military everywhere, um, different graves scattered everywhere. Um, they dropped this per parachute bomb. I actually have a picture of the parachute hanging off a tree on my phone. I forgot to put it on a slide, but they just put this in the, in the in the neighborhood and destroyed everything around it. This was not, as you guys see, a military target. Back in Odessa, we um, finally, uh, uh, funeral started to uh, be organized. We spent some time uh, with families of the loved ones going to collect their children. This is a 17 year old who was killed um, defending his village outside of Mykolaiv. Back in Odessa, I met the family of uh, Ivan. And Ivan uh, was a, one of the four uh, young, young recruiters who died by a missile at a military base in, um, in, in Mykolaiv. Um, yeah, you see, you see a lot of death around you, but it's, it's, it's very important to kind of, as a journalist, to keep Go and carrying yourself. That last image, I, I almost stopped photographing because it affected me because I had an uncle who got killed in, in Iraq serving as an interpreter with the U.S. military. So that's another photo. It kind of, I feel like I saw it as a young boy watching my, my grandparents, my parents crying over a 23, 23 years old. My uncle saw her at his casket um, after you know, the ugly side of the war. So a lot of images, I, I keep seeing them. I feel like I've seen them before and it, it's, it's really difficult sometimes to continue doing that. But um, you gotta have a job to do. I know, I hope this photos make it somewhere, kinda 
make people care about what's happening, seeing it from my eyes, um, kind of feeling what hopefully I felt when I photographed that, seeing the pain, the ugly side of the war, which is I hate all wars. I, I live through wars. I covering wars. I don't endorse any war. I hope there are wars and everywhere because at the end of the day, always the people who are the, the affected by, by this evil thing. Outside of Mykolaiv, we visited uh, uh, a, uh, a grave digger uh, who, um, his name is uh, Maluska, Maluska, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, who um, every day he instead of making new grave for a lot of soldiers, now he's um, um, removing missiles that are falling on a, on a cemetery which is, catches fire. And um, even the dead are not, um, are not uh, being left in peace. And that's exactly what I meant. There's no front line. The missiles are just getting fired from across the border or from the sea and falling on residential people and just not sure what's going on there. And uh, one of my last pictures I made, it was uh, we got access to the beach to see as the military waited for this um, Russian landing on that was never happened and uh, never happened. And then um, I got on a plane after this and then I went home to uh, uh, DC um, after first spending first few months. Uh, I grew my beard a little bit to go to Afghanistan. I didn't think I'm going to go to Ukraine, and as you know, I was in the war, so my beard grew really, really long. So I got home, took a sha uh, shave, and then uh, I was again taking a break and probably go going back to Ukraine. But um, my editors told me, we have a different project for you, as you know. Um, as you've covered fentanyl before, we would like you to work on this other thing. and. One of my first assignments for the Washington Post when I joined them in 2017 was going on a street of Philadelphia, photographing this new drug that's sweeping through the country, killing a lot of people, it's called fentanyl. And I've covered a bunch of stories since 2017 up to now, and they were like, well, you know the subject, can you please work on this project? You may go back to Ukraine at some point, and as you know, life of photojournalist, I never went back, I continue doing other stuff every day. But I spend my time covering uh, for the f f like half of the year, six months, another war, but at home, which is the war on drugs. Um, this thing, it's one of the worst things has hit America. And now, based on our uh, research and, and uh, work, it's uh, fentanyl is now is the leading um, death cause for American age 18 to 49. Just, just think about that. And um, we wanted to go to the source. We wanted to see the streets. We wanted to get in Mexico. And we wanted to see where is it coming for the largest amount of fentanyl, which is through uh, California border, San Diego, and the city of Tijuana in Mexico. And uh, we got embedded with um, 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 Mexican, like a federal police. They call the FGR as they bust these uh, labs. But, you know, corruption and other things, uh, every time we appear at a bust, there will be nobody there, <laughs> no drugs there. So it was very suspicious, a very interesting thing. But on the American side, the U.S. forces were capturing cars coming through uh, the border with full of drugs. Um, this is a bus we made, uh, undercover police, as they caught all these drugs, was loaded in a car and... and and uh, I always try to, um, even in a worse scenario, to make a um, kind of like a think of it as a human first affects everybody. And this um, boy was sleeping in a trailer when his dad came in a car with full of drugs and he had no idea. He just waking up to go to work and um, his dad, uh, you know, breaking down. His, the kid had no idea what's happening. Back in Mexico, we, go, we got into access to this warehouse was full of drugs and um, we were not sure uh, where these drugs go, and they were like, oh, every month we have a, like a, a, a tradition by burning all the drugs. So as we were standing there, it started feeling dizzy. I mean, in this, there's cocaine, uh, marijuana, fentanyl, chemicals, uh, uh, some, some other uh, opioids. And, um, and that black cloud went on the communities around the border, and I hope 
it didn't get anyone else sick. Um, a lot of the cars that got calcificated uh, in, in, in America end up in this graveyard of cars uh, that, you know, had drugs and now they get usually fixed and used by undercover police. In Mexico, we went to this uh, piñata shop, which is, uh, we thought, uh, uh, was very interesting. And actually, it was a drug uh, lab. They were hiding the pills, as you will see soon, inside uh, these piñatas, and then moving them around communities. And the biggest thing that's uh, killing a lot of Americans right now is this pill. It's called the blue pill. It's M30, and it's... Uh, press fentanyl with other precursors that's coming from China um, through the boats and into the um, uh, cartel and then they make those drugs and then it hit people in the streets and San Diego I got embedded with um, uh, an agent his name uh, Ed Byrne he's, uh, he's, he has documented over 400 uh, homicide related to fentanyl, so he's like one of the world experts on fentanyl. He knows exactly if this was fentanyl or something else. And we just drove around uh, uh, San Diego, did a lot of night shift with, uh, as, as they're trying to save a lot of people from overdosing. Some people make it, some people don't make it. And um, unfortunately, this is happening all across America right now. And as you, saw, you heard earlier, this is the le leading death uh, for Americans age 18 to 49. And uh, the officers are exhausted. This thing is just killing more people uh, now than, than before, even in 2017 when I was walking down the street learning about this new drug. Back in Tijuana, uh, the city is not only um, uh, people smuggling drugs to America. It's also there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of gang problems. Um, a lot of gangs they find people and uh, you know either kill them. This guy survived. Or maybe a deal go back down. Along the border, we met a lot of users, and uh, it was very interesting. We went to this safe house where they give them clean needles to shoot, so they don't get other diseases. Um, they don't give them the drugs. They just give them a clean needle so they can make the drugs in a safe way, and um, um, uh, use it and uh, around just around the corner from that safe house it's a beautiful park people are playing enjoying their life uh, children playing soccer um, I wanted to kind of tell the story a little bit more than just uh, people um, uh, uh, people shooting up only we spent time with this uh, person his name is Jose and Jose lived in California, got convicted for um, um, driving without a license, and then got shipped back to the border, and he got hooked on fentanyl. He's a user now. He spent the day by going, selling uh, iPhone uh, or phone ca uh, cases on the street. He makes a couple of pesos. He goes get a hit by a needle, and then um, he, he hopes to be clean one day. He saved a lot of people by um, giving them a, a Narcan. It's another thing that based of our reporting has helped uh, the government pass Narcan uh, for free. Now and it's on, sh on the shelf. You can not get it for free. It should be for free. It's a life-saving uh, medicine when someone overdoses, you can save them. I carry one now. I've given some to friends because it, it, I've seen so many deaths during this project and my time covering opioids. And one of the times we were spending time in the safe house, uh, these people were talking to them, interviewing them. All of the sudden, they kind of went to a different world. They threw the uh, needle kind of at me. As you see, I jumped back. And um, we, you cannot recognize them anymore. So it's a really, really sad um, disease that's, that's causing so many deaths and, and killing a lot of people. Uh, um, and, and a lot of the people we met uh, in Mexico, specifically the users, were like all um, 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 deported from America after having a minor problem and they all have families in America. The cars, the, the cars that are coming through uh, the border are the number one uh, way of smuggling drugs to America. And I'm not sure if a lot of the news make it in America here, um, the border that was built didn't really, doesn't really stop drugs because drugs could go above it, through it, under it in the tunnel, and the wall didn't really do its job to stop, maybe stop people, but the drugs are coming 
um, through a crazy amount of, of uh, volume through the cartel to America and killing so many Americans. And um, the, um, just the, a statistic someone told me through the Border Patrol, they said only we catch maybe only 12% of the drugs that come through America through the bo largest border crossing in America, uh, San Diego, maybe 12% if we're lucky a day we catch the drugs um, and everything else goes on the street. And unfortunately, it's a, it's a, it's a thing that I hope the government kind of fix it. Uh, if not, we'll unfortunately, see more death. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you.